Hello and welcome to the 12th lecture of Machine Learning for Robotics and Computer Vision. In this lecture we are looking at approaches to go beyond supervised learning. But before we start we have a recap of what happened in the last lecture. In the last lecture we looked at approaches for fine-grained scene understanding. Here we looked at semantic segmentation where we are interested in getting a pixel-wise label for each object in the scene and also surfaces in the scene. So that means we want to have for each pixel where to which class or object it belongs to. In the instance segmentation we are furthermore interested in distinguishing different kinds of uh, object instances. That means we want to identify pixels of each object such they are uh, corresponding to different objects like shown here with this cars. So for each of these regions we know that these pixels belong to a different car. And with this instance segmentation we are then getting also some information about the objects that are in the scene represented. Then bringing both together, the semantic segmentation but also the instance segmentation, we then had also discussed the so-called panoptic segmentation, which gives us both the pixel-wise semantic segmentation of um, stuff regions, something like ground or buildings or something like this, and the instance annotation for so-called thing regions where we have object classes which are uh, corresponding to countable objects or something where we have objects with clear defined boundaries like shown here the cars and also the bus in the background. And so we are getting both at the same time a semantic label for each pixel but also for the thing classes an instance label for the pixels. And for this we discussed common approaches and popular approaches to solve these different tasks like semantic segmentation, instance segmentation and panoptic segmentation. And uh, in the last lectures we talked a lot about how the deep learning approaches were, were successful in solving this task. So and deep learning brought basically astonishing progress in visual perceptions. So tasks like object detection um, progress that far that we can now use something like uh, YOLO detector and uh, provide a very um, rich scene annotation with bounding boxes for instance for very different object classes as shown here for this YOLO detection where we have persons but also maybe a push card and so very rich annotation of the image with um, detection bounding boxes. Or we are, can also get uh, very fine-grained semantic segmentation is shown here on the cityscapes data set with the seamless um, uh, scene segmentation approach which provides us with very fine-grained pixel-wise annotations of the whole image. And this whole progress was basically enabled by having large data sets available. So we started with the ImageNet approach uh, where we had uh, over 1 million images available and this large data sets basically enabled to learn something like a deep neural network with many many parameters. And for these approaches uh, the main workhorse basically is the supervised learning approach. And for this we are needing uh, large annotated data sets which made this progress possible. So but labeling data is very expensive. So First of all, it's very tedious, so you have to have a lot of annotators that take a lot of time and yeah, you also have to pay them for doing this task and this is of course then very expensive. When we are looking at some data sets that are commonly available, which we just used before, then this results in you know, the certain examples here. For instance, for the cityscapes data set, there was reported that it's or it takes for one image, when you have this fine grain annotation, something around one and a half hours um, to really annotate each pixel of this image. And when you then look at the data set size, which is like something for the fine grain annotation, something like 5,000 images, and then you do the computation, then you are getting something out like 7,500 7, hours that were just invested to label these images, which is something around 312 days. When we are then going to larger data sets like the Mapillary Vistas data set, then this is then yeah, a very larger data set with 25,000 images and when you then take the 1.5 hours per image 
um, which takes to annotate it with this semantic segmentation, pixel uh, segmentation, then uh, this takes around four and a half years. So it's, uh, yeah, it's even more time that was invested to just gather this data. And here in this case, there were 69 professional annotators um, and you can imagine that this was very costly in the end. And when we then go for another example, the MS Coco data set, which we also discussed a lot, um, there the authors provide in the um, overview of the paper, yeah, specific numbers because they used um, Amazon uh, Mechanical Turk for annotating these images and there they had a multi-stage ap approach. In the first level they basically did something like image annotation, so category labeling for each of the images, what categories are uh, basically present in this image, which took around 20, 22,000 uh, hours. Then taking then the instance spotting where you basically had to um, say for this, each specific category that were annotated before, where are the instances, which takes around 10,000 hours, and then the very fine-grained instance segmentation where you had to draw basically the instance segmentation mass. This was then something around 20,000, uh, 26,000 hours. And when you then compute everything together, it results in something like 6.6 .6 years of just annotation effort. And um, in this whole time, basically, is not is only the annotation included, but not also not always the also the validation of these annotations in the end, which takes also a lot of time. So the question is now: Are these large data sets uh, needed in a, in a way? They are needed because, or they are somehow needed because the capacity of the deep neural networks are, is very large. So you have a million of parameters. And commonly, when you have a lot of parameters, you want to have a lot of training data available to not risk the effect of overfitting in the end. Because with these large networks, it's basically easy to just remember in the end the training data. So the question is, do we always need first to invest a lot of time and money to get this labeled data? And the answer that I want to provide now also with some methods to get around this is of course no. So and this is a, a specific thing. So this is a, some sometimes a misconception that people have that you always need this large data sets. You can get around uh, uh, this. And uh, one prominent approach to get around and labeling a lot of data first is the so-called pre-training and fine-tuning scheme. In pre-training, you are training your network basically on an available data set that is already there, something like ImageNet. So that's the most common one um, because it's also one of the largest ones. And you are pre-training it on ImageNet. So you're training your network onto convergence, some architecture, something like here, in this case, the ResNet architecture. And then you're taking the weights that you train and then you are fine-tuning the network on the target data set. And in fine-tuning, you're basically, um, or in the most common case, you're just uh, freezing the parameters of the um, yeah, feature extractor and they're just replacing, in the end, the fully connected layer with the number of target classes or target scores that you want to have. In this case, maybe 10 um, classes that you want to have. And this, of course, are then uh, much fewer parameters and therefore you can get away with fewer labeled data. So um, usually when you also then use the pre-trained weights, you're already starting at a good point and therefore usually also the training is um, much faster in the end. So you're converging to a good solution in a fewer time. And it is of course less data intensive. And this, this scheme of using pre-trained weights for different tasks uh, was a pretty yeah, an, an insight that uh, was well received by the community in the end. So, and you can even, um, uh, so there was this paper where they just take the CNN features from a pre-trained network from ImageNet and then apply this to very different tasks. And at that time, they could beat all the traditional approaches by just using this pre-trained features on ImageNet and then using this fine-tuning scheme, fine scheme here. And so 
by using this uh, ImageNet features, they could then achieve the state-of-the-art performance on many of the state uh, of the different tasks that they investigated here by just using these features. And this was uh, quite surprisingly that you can just by using this um, very good feature extractors in the end to get then also good performance on some very different tasks in the end. Something like here, um, um, bird subcategorization, flower recognition, and even then um, scene image retrieval and something like this. So uh, this was quite surprising and also made hope that you um, yeah, don't have always to invest a lot of money in first getting a large, large data set to train your networks at the end. And what is also a, a effect is basically by using a pre-trained network, you usually can get also better performance than just using a small data set and then um, yeah, training from uh, random initialization in the end. So the so-called from scratch training. And here is an example taken from a paper um, where they investigated different tasks like classification, detection, and segmentation on the Pascal VOC dataset, which is much, much smaller than the ImageNet uh, um, um, dataset. And when you just train by randomly initializing the network until convergence, you're reaching something like 53% on the classification task. And when you just use the weights from the ImageNet and then train from there uh, and fine tune the network, then you are already reaching for the classification something like 78.2%. So, and um, this then transfers also to the other tasks like detection and segmentation. And the, the, the thing here is that you want to basically exploit that the um, image net you're learning in, at least in the low level part already features that help you in the end. And by, by just starting there, you can get um, to a much better result at the end. And uh, when we are now looking uh, a little bit further, what does the pre-training give you in the end? Um, then there was this result um, where they compared um, what do you need basically to, when you're not having pre-training in the end. Um, and here was the, uh, was the case, so what, when you see here the curve, this is with the ImageNet pre-trained network. And when you see these peaks that go up, at these points you uh, decrease basically the learning rate. And usually what you see when you um, not already converge, then, um, then you can get uh, yeah, a decent performance boost by decreasing the uh, learning rate. But we discussed this in the CNN training lecture. So the, the learning rate schedule is very important to get the final performance in the end. And what they showed here is when you um, do, uh, do this with the pre-training, you are getting f much faster to the final result in the end. So you're not getting much more out of this when you are training longer because you are reaching the same performance. But what was the insight is that you are not necessarily need the pre-training here. Um, for the random initialization, you basically have to train longer and then in the end you're reaching maybe the same performance. But the requirement for this is of course that you have enough target data available and of course time, which is not maybe something that you want to invest. So usually it's a good idea to start with pre-training on ImageNet and then starting from there. Um, and we also discussed a lot of architectures for doing ImageNet classification. And there the question which was also investigated is, does better performance on ImageNet also lead then to better transfer performance? So that means when we are using then a different data set. And the answer is also here yes. So the whole insights that you got about the CNN architectures, you can also use to your advantage. So by using the best performing ImageNet uh, model, you can get then also very good performance then on the tasks that you uh, yeah, want to solve in the end. And here it's shown on the x-axis is the ImageNet performance of different architectures. So each point corresponds to a different architectures. So they investigated 16 different architectures. So here's something like mobile net, but also inception rest nets and so on. And when you um, then use the fixed features, so uh, as I showed in the pre-training that you are just using the 
feature part and only fine tune basically the final fully connected layer. Then you're getting um, this correlation between the performance on the different data sets and the, uh, the architecture. And the same is also happening for when you completely fine tune the network. So from um, start, uh, from the end to the start. So that means you are adjusting all the weights, not only the last layer weights. And also here you can see with better performance on ImageNet, you're reaching then also better performance on the task that you initially, uh, that you want to solve in the end. So the takeaway is basically better performance on ImageNet also transfers to better performance on other data sets. But <coughs> one particular problem is here, so um, because I talked about uh, this already a little bit, that if your, um, yeah, your task that you want to solve is too different from ImageNet, then um, yeah, you will not gain so much from the ImageNet pre-training. And this is particularly true when you're thinking of different kinds of data, something like um, satellite images or um, medical images, which are very different from the normal images that people maybe take with their smartphone. And usually the performance that you then get out from yeah, using the pre-trained network is maybe not as good as so, so far. So the larger the, uh, the, the gap between the domains, the, um, yeah, the, the less you can basically exploit that you have already learned these features. And this is the so-called domain gap. And this domain gap happens, for instance, here with the satellite images, but also for, for specifically with medical images. So, and when you then also think of different sensors like this RGBD sensor or this hyperspectral camera, this is then the so-called modality gap, then of course uh, you cannot directly use basically or exploit, for instance, the depth information from an RGBD sensor when you are just using the ImageNet features because ImageNet has no depth information available. And when you specifically think of a hyperspectral camera where you have maybe 1000 channels, um, you cannot basically just use a pre-trained network from ImageNet and expect that it somehow magically extracts some useful information from all these channels. So coming to this, you, you maybe think, okay, then we are back at labeling. So we just, when we change the domain, we have to start again. And here also the answer is no, basically, um, because we can do a different thing here. And for, um, yeah, such data sets, we have a large collection of satellite images, for instance, we can use something that's so-called a pretext task. So a pretext task is a task that you initially solve to uh, then solve your other tasks afterwards. And these pretext tasks are then designed in such a way that they can perform, be performed self-supervised. So for instance, in this example here, you um, have your images um, from your other data set and then you cut something out and then you want to have your pretext task specific part to fill in this part. And this is the thing that you are then pre-training the CNN in, 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 in this case. And um, the idea is that by solving this task, you want to get a good representation out. And um, this can be then the features. And when you then have the, so, yeah, trained this task such that you're yeah, that the network is converged in the end, you're taking then the pre-trained CNN, you're throwing away basically the part that is maybe only responsible for solving the pretext task, and then you can start from there to train your um, yeah, data on the final data set, uh, which you want to solve in the end. So, um, and common pretext tasks are something like here in this case, this, um, uh, relative position prediction of the patches. So you get two patches of this image and you want to say um, in which relation are the patches to each other. So that means the cat face and then you get the ear and you want to predict that it should be in the upper right part. Um, some other task that was uh, proposed was to just cut out parts of an image and then rearrange it and then you should predict how to rearrange it in a way that it gives the image out in the end. And the third task that was investigated here is was to predict how the image was rotated. And the common idea of this task is basically by solving this, 
that you need something uh, yeah, to know about the visual appearance of uh, the objects in the, the image and by solving this you already have a good starting point for your training in the end. And um, so by solving this task you must capture somehow the visual information in the images. And the prospect of the self supervision is in the end that you then hopefully can get away with fewer labels. So here are two curves shown. So the uh, ResNet was just trained with a specific number of ImageNet labels, like 1% of all the ImageNet labels, or 1% of all training images from ImageNet. And then you reach something around 45% of top 5 classification accuracy. And by using then the pre-training strategy, um, you hopefully get then um, yeah, higher performance with fewer labels in the end. And this is then the thing that we are specifically interested in. And um, yeah, when you are then using more uh, labels, you are getting basically then in the end um, a similar performance. And the good thing about this pre-training task is that you are usually get also uh, more generalizable models, so even with fewer labels. And for solving the self-supervision task, there were this handcrafted pr pr um, um, pretext task that we discussed, like this puzzle or this rearrangement of the, the image where you have to predict the relative position. And one um, um, yeah, thing that now is currently taking up a little bit of traction uh, in this, this space of self-supervised uh, pre-training is the so-called contrastive learning. And in contrastive learning, it's very similar to the embedding idea that we had, um, is that you are, have uh, so-called positive examples, which represent the same object or the same class. And these examples you want to put in the feature space near to each other. And in, uh, for the negative examples, you want to push them away. So that, that's the very similar idea to what we have with CornerNet or something like this. That you have the, embe the embeddings or the, the feature vectors or your representations such that uh, for similar objects, they are close together. And for different objects, they should be far apart. So the question is now, how do you get this positive and negative examples in a self-supervised way? And there's an easy way. So you're taking the images that you have from your data set and you generate then um, two different augmentations of this image. So something like a cutout or a color distortion and you're doing this in a pairwise fashion. And then you have your positive pairs. These pairs should then correspond to representations that are close to each other. So this is the, then the positive examples. And the negative examples are basically then just the other for this positive example basically the other all other images are basically the negative examples and this you can then exploit in a specific way to learn then features that are corresponding to this uh, property that positive examples are near to each other and negative examples are hopefully far away from each other and for this uh, to learn this we need a loss function again and the most common used loss function for Solving this task is the so-called contrastive loss. And here you have n representations, um, which is then the, the pairwise representations that we had from before. And now let for the um, east example, the i plus example, be the positive example. So the, the other augmented view that we had extracted from before. And then we are using this in a contrastive loss. Um, which uh, looks very similar to the cross entropy loss in a way that we have the positive example um, in the nominator and in the denominator we have the sum over all other examples. So and here um, we are not taking the, um, yeah, the same image here into account so the k is, goes for, uh, is not equal to i and we are taking here the similarity. And one specific thing that uh, is usually done is that you have this temperature parameter in, which is just a scaling parameter, which you yeah, have to select as a hyperparameter. So this is a fixed parameter in the end. And the similarity that we are interested in is usually the uh, cosine similarity, which is just the scalar product of the two vectors divided by the length of the vectors. 
And this gives us then our objectives that we can optimize. So and this will then naturally lead to that the positive examples, so to minimize the loss, you want to have the positive examples with a, a similarity of one in the, in the end, and then the uh, dissimilar part goes in the denominator, so to reduce the loss, you want to um, yeah, um, make this as small as possible. And by using this, you are getting, getting out the, um, the uh, yeah, best possible feature representation that fulfills the uh, initial goal or objective of having the positives close together and the negatives far away. And one particular approach to solve this was the so-called Sinclair approach, um, where uh, you have now your images, you make two augmentations of this, the F is basically the CNN that we want to pre-train. So you can basically here, for instance, use a ResNet 50, which gives us then the feature representation. And uh, we are not now applying the contrastive loss directly on the feature representation, but on a projection. And this projection um, is in particular important and will then also lead to better performance in the end. And then we are using the contrastive loss on this set i and set j. And um, um, yeah, this, these projections are then also called usually the latent uh, vector that you're interested in. And when you train then the network until the end, you're just drawing away the projection and you're just keeping this f, which is basically the CNN you want to pre-train in a self-supervised fashion here. Um, and the projection specifically is now a small uh, multi-layer perceptron, so it's a fully connected layer with a non-layerity in between, in this case a ReLU activation, and then a fully connected layer in the end. And this gives you then a, a vector out, which you then can use in a contrastive loss. We talked now a little bit about the augmentations. So in the paper, they investigated also which augmentations are useful for learning a good representation in the end. And here they investigated something like crop and resize, uh, flipping um, the color distortions and different other um, distortions that you can just apply by using something like scikit, um, um, uh, the scikit image um, uh, 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 library in the end. And um, they not only used one augmentation, but combined uh, two different augmentations together. And for this, they also um, uh, made a large experiment over the different combinations of um, the first transformation that you apply, something like cropping, cutout, color distortion, and so on, and the second augmentation that you apply on top of this. And as you can see here from this graph, it, yeah, it turns out, so here you have the, 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 the uh, uh, image net performance basically from zero to over 50%, and as you can see here, so the combination of cropping plus color distortion is basically the best. It doesn't matter so much in which order you do it, but uh, this is clearly the top performing um, um, image augmentation that you want to apply. And this was then also applied. But the question is now um, how much you distort uh, the image in the end, so how much you crop maybe from the image, or how much are the different crops from the image overlapping or something like this. And this was answered in a different um, publication where they asked themselves, okay, how much you have to distort. And there the insight was that, of course, the right amount of data augmentation is crucial for the downstream task. If you're doing too much augmentation, you're basically losing all information. If you are not using, uh, if you do it only yeah, too mildly the, the augmentation by just changing it not drastically enough, you're not you're, you're keeping a lot of irrelevant uh, information in the end. So this was the insight. And there's for the different augmentations, there's basically a sweet spot um, where you get the best performance. And this you can then use for the specific tasks you want to solve in the end. So, but usually there are specific uh, ways of doing the data augmentation in the right way, which is uh, uh, quite canonical. So, um, as long as you're not maybe in this region or in this region, 
um, you are getting uh, quite good performance in the end. But more information you can find in the specific paper on how much augmentation you should uh, perform in the end. Um, coming back to the SimClear approach, um, we talked a little bit about the positive and negatives. And what turned out to be here crucial is that you have a very large number of negatives. So the batch size basically corresponds to the number of negatives that you have. And the larger you make the batch size, the higher the performance. And what you can also see here on the x-axis that you also have to train very long. So it's uh, like 1000 epochs in the end. So it's much longer than you usually train when you just do image net pre uh, training, which is something around 90 epochs usually, or something like 100 epochs maybe. But um, here in this case from the contrastive learning, you need a yeah, very long training scheme in the end. Um, but this large batch size has of course now the disadvantage when you have a large batch size, you need to put a lot of data on the GPU and you are basically restricted by the amount of yeah, memory you have available on the GPUs or the number of GPUs you have to available. Um, and therefore the so-called momentum contrast uh, try to solve this in the end um, by using a different idea. So here on the left you see the SimClear approach where you have um, the, um, uh, yeah, this, this, this uh, one patch and the other patch that are passed through the encoder then you get the features out, you then compute the contrastive loss, and you're basically then updating the positive and negatives at the same time. What uh, the momentum contrast now does uh, differently is that it only updates one part of the encoders. The other part is a so-called momentum encoder that will not be directly updated by um, using the gradients that you computed from, con from the con uh, contrastive loss. And therefore, here this sign is usually the stop gradient, so you're not propagating the gradient back. Um, and one other part that they introduced, so the first thing was the separation of the encoders. So you have only one encoder and the other encoder is basically not learned at the same time, not directly. Um, how this is updated I will show on the next slide. And you had the um, Q of negative examples, which you can maybe also make larger than the um, batch size that you are targeting. So, um, and by having this Q, you can basically then have a lot more um, negative examples, but don't incur the penalty of yeah, having to also store the gradients to then the back propagation in the end to update the parameters of the so-called momentum encoder. And the momentum encoder works now as follows, that you um, update the parameters of the momentum uh, encoder, uh, theta k, um, by having a um, yeah, weighted average between the current momentum encoder parameters plus the parameters that you're updated here in this part. And um, the typical value that you choose is that it's something like 0 0.999, so that means your the, the influence from the parameters that you are updating here in this part of the encoder um, is uh, very mild. So you're slowly updating um, the parameters here over time. And this gives you then also the um, possibility to use a large queue of examples which are then um, computed with these um, yeah, slowly updated parameters in the end. And by using this, you are getting then um, yeah, uh, good performance out. Um, but um, the momentum encoder or MoCo and the SimClear approach um, were basically proposed at the same time. And then the authors of the momentum contrast saw the SimClear paper and then thought like, okay, we, we don't have this uh, projection head in and uh, apparently this is a good idea so they came then up with the so-called MoCo version 2 um, where they inspired by the success of the SimClear approach um, then introduced this projection head used much stronger data augmentation that's what was also critical to get perform a good performance and they look for better parameters for the temperature and what they also did uh, is train much, much longer, so more epochs, but as you can see, the improvement from the 
Moco version 1 approach to the Moco version 2 approach was then quite significant by um, using this here. And so as you can see here, this is the projection head. So MLP is the uh, projection head, which was not in Moco version 1 present, then the stronger data augmentation and the cosine learning schedule that is also shown here. And by using this together with the idea of this Q that you have with the momentum encoder, you can then also get away with um, a much smaller batch size than was used by the SimClear approach, which even used then batch sizes of over 8,000 um, images, which is yeah maybe not something that you want to use. And the MoCo approach, uh, at least the author said this in the paper, can then also be trained on a system with just 8 GPUs instead of using, I think, 32 or 64 TPUs uh, from Google. Um, and this is quite uh, promising in the end. Um, but the need for having this many um, negative examples is in the end is still also happening here. So you, you need also a large number of um, negative examples in your queue to train this. And one interesting approach which comes around this is basically the so-called bootstrap your own latent. Um, where the network structure is very similar to what we had before. So you have your data augmentation that you are applying to one image. So you have two different views of the same image. Then you have your encoder network, which is the CNN you want to pre-train. Then you have your projection head. And what they now introduced is to have this prediction head. And the prediction head now predicts what the other encoder should output um, or outputs in the end. So you have this target encoder, which is uh, very similar to the momentum um, encoder that uh, um, we had with MoCo. And we have this online encoder, which is then producing um, yeah, the, the feature that we want to have. And here we have this prediction head that takes the, um, yeah, the predicted uh, uh, feature and then predicts what the other target encoder um, outputs at the end. And as you can see here, the, there's also the stop gradient. So this is not directly updated, only this part is updated. And the update is not now happening with the contrastive loss in the normal way that you um, yeah, compare the, um, the, um, the different uh, views directly, but you're comparing the prediction which you make for the online part with the target um, 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 embedding that you get out. And by using this idea, you can get basically away without any negative examples in the end. So because the only thing that you're doing here is you're doing, um, yeah, like I said, the, um, um, the data augmentation of the views. So you have basically two positive examples here. And by using this prediction head, you can then get a loss function that only uses this. And the loss function is then um, just the difference between the prediction of the um, online network for the specific um, uh, project, uh, pro projected um, uh, projection um, minus the output of the target network. And this is just the uh, mean uh, squared error here. And when you then write it out, you can reformulate it. And then you see that this cross bends then to something like the cosine similarity in the end. And um, the as with the MoCo, the online network is not directly updated via the backpropagation, but is using again this momentum um, update where you update the parameters of the um, um, target network by using the parameters of the um, online network or the online encoder in the end. And this is all that you need there. And this is uh, yeah, pretty... Uh, pretty surprising that this uh, it, uh, at least works and it works uh, also very well in the end. So by using this strategy here you have the results in comparison. So um, we have here the um, MoCo approach which has a very large number of parameters and can reach then uh, something with pre-training and then fine-tuning on ImageNet and you reach something like um, 
60, yeah, 69% um, of performance when you then use uh, different variants of SimClear with different um, sizes of um, the network. So this 2x and 4x are basically uh, the increase in the number of channels that you apply in the ResNet 50 in this case. Um, then you can get up to over 76% in top one accuracy on ImageNet. So here, this, all these networks are basically just fine-tuned the, the, the linear part. So this is important. So that's um, not using all the labels from ImageNet for um, also learning the um, feature representation, but just using the freest um, pre-trained network and then just fine-tune the final fully connected layer. And by just using this, you can then already reach this performance. But as you can see, the um, difference between what you get when you do the fully supervised training is still large. And with the um, bootstrap your own latent, um, um, you get then, when you have very large networks, at least um, near to the performance that you just use by, get by fully supervised training. And this is uh, quite, uh, yeah, quite important. So, and when you then even use larger networks, uh, so a 200 layer um, a ResNet network, then you're getting um, yeah, also much better performance in the end. And um, you cannot only apply this basically to uh, ImageNet, but they also investigated how it performs when you transfer to different data sets. So this is the part that we are maybe interested in. Um, we do the pre-training on ImageNet and then we are applying this to smaller data sets like Cypher 10, Cypher 100, um, BirdSnap and so on and so on. So the different data sets and as you can see um, with SimClear you're getting already um, very good performance but when you are then using the bootstrap method um, you're getting much much better performance and sometimes even for the fine-tuned parts um, you're getting better performance by just uh, using the uh, self-supervised training instead of using a supervised ImageNet free training. So you don't need basically the labels to first produce for ImageNet. And this is um, yeah, quite quite important result. And then you can see here in 7 from, of 12 data sets you're getting basically also better performance than the ImageNet pre-training. But you cannot only apply the contrastive learning idea to um, this image classification part, but you can also maybe specifically attach uh, this to other tasks. And there was the detection contrast, um, where the idea was to learn specifically features that are suited for object level um, um, performance uh, or object level um, um, image interpretation. And in this case, um, they targeted detection but also semantic segmentation and the idea is here not to use the whole view but uh, generate an, um, yeah, a mask of the image which is just um, a standard um, segmentation approach that you can apply and then use the mask um, together with the data augmentation to produce new images and then compute the features with the encoder, so this is again the network that you want to pre-train, and then you have the convolutional features, and then you aggregate it in the, for each mask, you pool the features and you get then the feature vector out that you're interested. And instead of computing now feature vectors for the whole image, you're computing feature vectors for the uh, specific mask, and then you're comparing the uh, individual masks that correspond to the same um, yeah, initial mask that you had and um, then you have features from the same mask you uh, want to have yeah, get them together and from different masks you basically want to um, um, get them away. And for generating the mask um, they investigated now different ways of doing this and here there was the um, yeah, different yeah, from very simple approaches to generate the mask like just a um, yeah, a spatial subdivision of the image to more sophisticated masks like uh, this um, um, MCG approach which uh, gives them very fine-grained masks to something intermediate which is just the 
a super pixel segmentation, um, which is often used also in the selective search approach. I think it was used um, um, to generate this mass. And the um, yeah, trade-off between performance and quality is basically the best for the um, uh, super pixel segmentation. And this was then also used for generating the results in the end. So when you have then the mask and the contrastive learning approach where you compare the feature vectors of the different masks, you can then get these results in the end. And these are uh, yeah, even better when you are just uh, using the supervised pre-training with ImageNet, you can get even uh, much better performance when you have then the um, uh, detection contrast approach here. And um, as they show here, you view basically um, the, uh, on the x-axis is not now the number of images that you are using, there's the number of um, epochs that you are using for the um, uh, ImageNet pre-training. And you can see here that you um, basically get a similar performance to the ImageNet pre-training with um, yeah, a fifth of the uh, pre-training that you use for the fully supervised ImageNet pre-training. And here this is the COCO data set, the instance segmentation, but also semantic segmentation. And as you can see, the idea of using the mass to get object level, um, more object level information is then helping in the end to solve this task. And yeah, this is yeah the one thing that happened this year. But I'm sure that there is much more progress happening in future uh, where you can then also use these approaches in very different domains. And with this, I'm already at an end. So in this lecture, we discussed um, how to get uh, away from the poorly supervised training because this doesn't scale. We cannot label all images um, if we want to solve a new task or maybe um, yeah, extend our application in the end. And so therefore we want to get away from first labeling a lot of data then to train our network. And for getting away from this, we discussed um, the first thing that we can do, we are just using pre-trained networks, so something like on ImageNet or other data sets, which we then can use to start from there. And by using this idea of the pre-training and then fine-tuning, we can then get um, very good results on the target data set or target application that you want to, to solve in the end with only very little annotated data. But this only brings us so far because when we have a different sensor or a different modality um, and or a different domain, something like medical images, then the the gap between what we saw in the ImageNet data or some other data is maybe too large to get very well transferring models on this specific application. And for this, we discussed the so-called self-supervised pre-training approaches which just need the data itself and then can produce labels in a way that they can apply contrastive learning to learn good representations. And for this, we discussed yeah, a bunch of approaches like the Simclear approach, the MoCo and the bring a bootstrap your own latent, which were very powerful approaches that even reached the performance or were near the performance when you use a purely supervised training on ImageNet in the end. And yeah, with this, I'm now at the end. I thank you for your attention and then see you next week.